Who is the best chess player of all time? This question gets discussed relentlessly in various internet forums and videos. And while we may never have an exact answer to this question, I think there is definitely an argument to be made to who is the most talented player of all time. You might have guessed it already by the thumbnail and or title of the video, I'm talking about Paul Morphy. We will first have a quick look at his life and afterwards analyze one of his most brilliant games ever that you probably haven't seen yet. So who was Paul Morphy? Paul Morphy was born in 1837. His mother was a concert pianist and his dad was a judge at the Louisiana Supreme Court of Justice. So in other words, he was born with a silver spoon in his ass. Is that the right expression? He began playing chess when he was very young and also was famous for being good at a very young age. When he was 12, he wasn't only defeating a lot of very good adult chess players, he was often defeating them blindfolded. At the age of 12, blind. So if your father is at the state Supreme Court, you might as well have a career in law. So Paul Morphy went to the University of Louisiana and got a law degree. The funny thing was, in his state, he was too young to actually practice law because he was only 20 years old. So he had a law degree, but he wasn't allowed to practice. That's some nice flex. Imagine like you have the degree, but you're just ah, too young, too much of a prodigy. So you're 20 years old, you're a very good chess player, and you're not allowed to work. Like literally not allowed to work. So what do you do? You go play some chess, of course. So Paul Morphy toured across all of America and demolished the old masters. And when I say demolished, I mean demolished. For example, Louis Paulson, which was thought to be one of the greatest chess players in all of America, if not the greatest chess player of all America, lost to Morthy with five losses, only one win and two draws. So out of eight games, Morphy won five. No one was able to do that at that time. So Morphy got bored. He still couldn't practice law, but in America there just weren't any opponents for him. So what do you do when you're incredibly wealthy and incredibly bored? Correct, you go to Europe. In Europe, Morphy just kept going. He just went from town to town and destroyed all the masters. With one exception, Howard Staunton. So, what, do you mean Staunton defeated him? No, of course not. Staunton was way too scared to play Morphy. Morphy already invited Staunton to New Orleans when he was still in America, but Staunton was like, nah, I don't want to travel to America on your expenses. You should come to Europe and we'll play here. All right, so Morphy went to Europe. When Morphy was in Europe, Staunton was like, ah, I don't have the time, I gotta write something about Shakespeare or some stuff, like, who cares? Just play Paul Morphy. And then Morphy was like, well, I wait, no problem. Yeah, if, if you don't have pl time to play chess, I, I have time. So Howard Staunton came up with another excuse to not play Paul Morphy. He said Morphy didn't have enough money to make the chess interesting for him. Now, you gotta know, back then, chess did not have exactly a good reputation. And I'm not talking about the kind of reputation it has nowadays, with Nakamura getting punched in the face and uh, certain chess grandmasters allegedly putting stuff up their bum. No, I'm talking about chess was viewed as gambling. There's probably nothing that's as far away from gambling as chess. Like, it literally has no aspect of luck. Whatever. So Morphy, coming from a wealthy family, didn't like the thought of playing chess for money. He always played chess for free, but Morphy still wanted to play Howard Staunton, so he put up 2,000 pounds worth of prize money. Now, maybe you think, that's not actually that much. Well, this was back in the 1840s. So if you calculate the inflation and convert it to dollars, it would equal, nowadays, about $250,000, so a quarter million of prize money. If that's not enough prize money, I, I don't know, I, I will play Paul Murphy for that. I mean, I will get destroyed, but who cares? Quarter million, come on. Those, those are good chances, like, it's 50-50, either you win or you lose. So sadly, the game with Howard Staunton never happened, so Staunton still was able to walk around and say that he never lost the game to Paul Murphy. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, Walter, you're just an asshole. After his tour in Europe, Paul Morphy was accepted as the unofficial world champion. He went back to America and started his law career, 
which then sadly got interrupted by the civil war. Now, even after the war, he wasn't really successful, sadly. Most of his clients just wanted to discuss chess with him and not legal cases. That's probably also a reason why he retired completely from chess. But even after he did that, he just couldn't make it as a lawyer. But if we're honest, this was known from the beginning. It only could go wrong. I mean, after all, it's called Morphe's Law. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah. After that, we don't know a lot about Paul Morphy's life. It certainly got very quiet around him. He stopped practicing law because he was just very unsuccessful and his family was loaded. Yeah, had a lot of money. So he just lived off his family money and uh, for the rest of his days, which actually weren't that long because it was reported that around the age of 40, Paul Morphy got insane. He was known before to be some kind of a strange guy. I mean, okay, if your whole life revolves around chess, you're probably a strange guy. Well, I have other things in life. I doubt it. <laughs> he always was known to be kind of a strange guy. For example, he was known to organize all of his shoes in a semi-circle in his otherwise perfectly organized neat room. And when he was asked why he did this, he answered that he wanted to be able to place his hand on any pair he liked at any time. Um, that's certainly an explanation. But it got pretty far downhill from there. He was reported to walk down the street loudly talking with himself. Did someone say crazy person? No? Well, I heard it. Then, sadly, he died at the age of 47, brought on by a bath after a long walk in the midday heat. But now enough with sad death stories, let's have a look at one of his games. All right, so let's have a look at one of his games. We have Paul Morphy with the white pieces, and Thomas Herbert Worrall with the black pieces. Worrall wasn't that famous of a chess player, but he was pretty good. In the Rui Lopez Arriven is the Worrall attack named after him. So you might be noticing that there is a knight missing on b1, and it's not because I was too stupid to set up the chessboard, be because it's on a computer. You, I, you don't really set it up. I, I really wasn't able to mess this up, no. It is because Paul Morphy oftentimes played with a handicap. He even refused to play a normal game of chess at one point because it was just too boring for him. So this is also one of his handicap games. Let's see what Paul Morphy does. We have e4, e5, and pawn to f4, the king's gambit. This was a very popular opening at that time. Of course, black takes the pawn, as you should, and Morphy keeps developing with knight to f3. We have g5. Now, g5 was played back then quite a bit. I never actually saw it nowadays played. Also, it's not very good. Probably that's why there are no new games with it. But back then, a few people played it against Morphy and they all got stomped. After g5, we have bishop to c4 and g4 attacking the knight. Now, Morphy already being a piece down, of course, saved the knight. At all right, Morphy played d4. Now we all know Morphy was famous for sacrificing pieces, but that's not called sacrificing. That's just hanging a piece. On move five. You know what the crazy thing is? The computer actually kind of agrees with that. If you have a look at what Stockfish14 says, we're using the cloud engine here on Leeches, it thinks that saving the knight to e5 is minus 6.5. And not saving the knight, but playing d4, is minus 7. So that's actually pretty close. Morphy played d4. We have g takes f3 and castles. Both pawns are hanging, and black saves one of them. This is already a pretty bad move. Now, why is it a bad move? The pawn was hanging, you save it. See, black at that point is up two full pieces. Two full knights, yeah? Almost no compensation material-wise. There is some positional uh, compensation, but we can pretty much disregard that because it's the opening and you're down two full pieces. Now what you want to do now is you want to get your pieces out, you're going to play the knight out, play d6, get the bishop out, probably here, 
play the queen out and castle. If you don't want to play the knight, you can play d6 right away, get the bishop out, and get the knight out, get the queen out and castle. Pretty simple stuff. What you don't want to do is worrying about one or two pawns, especially if they're weak as hell and tripled. Who cares? You shouldn't be worried about your tripled pawns. You should be worried about your king being in the center and you playing Paul Morphy. So anyways, bishop to h6. Queen takes f3. And we have knight to c6. And this is a blunder. Wait, didn't you just said like 30 seconds ago that I should play knight to c6? Yes, but that was the move before. Now Morphy has developed another piece and now this is a blunder. For example, this pawn is still hanging. You protected it before, this is hanging now. So Morphy could take it, develop a piece. If you take back, I take the queen and I'm just firing on all forces. So, all right. Morphy sacks another piece. He started without a knight or with a knight down, sacked the other knight and now sacked the bishop. It's move eight. That's a sacking percentage of over 30%. Yeah, that's the thing I'm, I'm inventing now, the sacking percentage. So we sacked another piece. Black of course takes, and now we have queen to h5. Oh, and by the way, do you know what the crazy thing is? Bishop takes f7 is the only move that equalizes for white. Yes, I'm not saying it's the best move, I'm saying it even equalizes. The computer now, if you take it, gives the, evalu bleh, gives the evaluation, gives the evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. Ball. 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 The computer now gives the evaluation of 0, 0.0, because there is some perpetual check in the future, even if black plays perfectly. We have queen to h5, king to g7, and bishop takes f4. Now, here black plays a very sensible move, he takes the bishop. And uh, this is actually quite instructive. If you're getting attacked, you want to exchange attackers. So this is a good move. Only problem is, it allows white to activate the rook even further. And after knight to h6, bringing another protector, protector, defender, bringing another defender into the game, and rook to f1, it's not looking that good. Black plays queen to e8, trying to exchange the queens here. Of course, Morph Morphy doesn't do that. He plays queen to h4. We have d6, bringing yet another defender into the game. And queen f6 check. The king has to go to g8, it has no other squares. And now Morphy takes the knight. For once, he's taking some material. Bishop d7, and here I'm almost a bit sad, because Morphy actually missed a mate in 5. And the worst thing is, it's such a Morphy-esque mate! Oh, no, that's not the mate he missed. He missed rook to f8, sacrificing the rook. If queen takes, we have queen g5 check, the queen intercepts, Queen to d5 check, and the bishop can stand in the way, but you just take it. Now, queen to f7 is the only move that gets out of the check because of this. And queen takes f7 mate. Now I know what you're saying, yeah, mate in 5 is hard to spot, but it's Paul Murphy, he could have spotted it. But maybe he didn't want to because he thought the other mate is even cooler, which it kind of is. So he didn't do that, he didn't sack the rook, sadly. He played rook back to f3. Knight to e7, bringing in another defender, or at least trying to. And now h4. We have knight to g6, and this is also the point of h4, because now Morphy can just BAM play h5, yeah? Getting the knight out, out of the way, saying, I don't want your defending pieces here, yeah? Go away! Bishop to g4, counter-attacking, kind of, and Morphy takes the knight. If we look at the material, it's almost equal now. Both have, both have a rook, both have a queen. Uh, black has this bishop, but white has some extra pawns. And here I don't understand what black did. Now, you played bishop to g4, and this is actually a thing that a lot of beginners also do. They play a move, 
with an intention yeah, to take the rook. And when it's then their turn to move again, they just don't do it. Now, it would have been very good to take the rook. You can take the rook. And you might say, but wait, don't I lose my rook? Yes, but I can play queen to g6 now. The best move is to trade queens. After you take back, I take the rook, make a queen. Of course, you take with the king. And then I take your bishop. And now you are in a losing endgame with black, because white is up a pawn. And also the pawn structure is better, because white has no pawn islands. And black has this, uh, has this isolated but unpassed pawn on the g-file. But if you ask me, if I wanted to play Morphe in a middle game where he's attacking me, or if I wanted to play him in a losing endgame, I would take the losing endgame every day of the week. So, black maybe didn't see this, maybe didn't calculate it, maybe didn't see the whole thing, but he didn't do it. Instead, he took with the pawn. And now it's made in 3. And maybe Morphe didn't spot made in 5, but he definitely sees made in 3. You can pause the video here if you want to try to find it yourself. So let's keep going. I hope you found it. It's rook to f8. And after queen takes f8, rook takes queen, rook takes f8, sacrificing both rooks, queen to g6, checkmate. So Paul Morphy started with a knight less, gave the knight away, sacrificed the bishop, sacrificed the rook, sacrificed another rook, and then checkmated with the queen. If that's not epic, I don't know what is. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, please let me know in the comment section below. Also, let me know what you thought about the editing and overall stuff. I'm very happy to get some constructive criticism on my video. Have a nice day and I'll see you hopefully next week with another video.